All right, Madame Ellisliff. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of the witnesses for some fundamental uh, testimony. From each of your statements, uh, you've made it clear that there remains a problem in the Canadian Armed Forces with respect to this topic, and that progress has barely been made, if at all. That the military culture is by design strong, and that policy is not successful necessarily in changing that culture. And now that we see that it's at the most senior level, that they're not isolated incidents, and that more officers are implicated by their actions and or their silence, we recognize that this problem has actually been 30 years in the making because military culture starts at military college or as junior officers. And so when it comes to the battle between policy and culture, policy is clearly losing. This is not the first time we had the sexual harassment and racism prevention program in the 90s, and that summarily failed. And now we have attempted to do a similar repeat with Operation Honor without changing the foundational elements. So my question to you all is, how do we change the fundamental cultural elements? It clearly cannot be done from within. And even more importantly, how do we set the tone and hold all of those who may be complicit in perpetuating the culture at these senior officer levels accountable? You can, if anyone has an answer, just uh, go ahead and jump right in. Okay, I think Ms. Uh, Dr. English. Well, I can start. I mean, I, and that's a great question, a very complex one. It sounds like one we go over in some of my seminars. But uh, I think, you, you know, the short answer in all of this is that uh, armed forces are very good, and the Canadian forces is excellent in dealing with short-term, well-defined problems. And um, that's what they're set up to do. But because they have very rapid turnover, in uh, leadership positions every two to three years, the leaders change, they have a lot of trouble maintaining focus over long-term problems. And that's why they're generally, in my view, not, not uh, very effective at long-term problems. So um, the really the only way to be successful, and I think just about everyone's mentioned it, is to have an external body, a truly external body, um, to hold people to account. So even though the senior leadership might change, and just as a, a, a small fact that may uh, interest you, over the five years between when Operation Honor was released and the Path to Dignity and Respect was released, there were seven vice chiefs of the defense staff. And the vice chief of the defense staff it was responsible for the oversight of Operation Honor. So that is just a pretty stark example of one of the reasons why it didn't succeed. So to me, an external body is ex essential. Um, one example... Would you uh, include in that external body an external body to hold people potentially who have uh, committed infractions accountable as well? Uh, I would personally i'm i'm i think i'd separate them out i th i think there needs to be one to supervise the the culture change and then another one perhaps to hold individuals to account because the culture change job is such a big um project that really needs a dedicated group and and you know the the most recent example was after the um, somalia um scandal and and the uh, reform somali reforms the the minister appointed a minister's mount monitoring committee that reported directly to him and he was able to hold the calf to account but anyway there are lots of different models i think i'll stop there and let others talk all right dr, dr. algros oh. oh go ahead
Am I going first or yes, sure, go ahead. Okay. You, you please. <laughs> okay. Um, so speaking of culture, uh, I think we can recognize the the opacity of the current culture, and uh, I want us to switch the framing from operational effectiveness to organizational effectiveness. Uh, Op Honor framed misconduct as a problem that undermines operational effectiveness. And uh, I think moving forward, it would be prudent to talk about organizational health. Uh, organizational effectiveness is a prerequisite for operational effectiveness. And the way that the forces get ready for operations is through training, exercises, certification. You plan for and you practice until your instincts are right. And even in difficult, complex environments with high stress, sleep deprivation, you will perform in a way that is consistent with your training. And on the other hand, we have op honor training, which consists of passing on information about sexual misconduct. It's ticking the box, and we don't worry so much about how the information is retained or applied beyond monitoring who's up to date on their training and who's not. So while I fully agree with my colleagues that it's important to look at, at culture, I think it's important to look at culture through different phases of the, of the career. Uh, and to look at how military identity is, is developed throughout these stages. But I also really believe in the importance of, of some more bureaucratic fixes, and, and training is one of them. And we need to give uh, this kind of training as much important as the, the, the other types of training that happen in the military. Uh, so here, I think a different approach is needed. And Thank you. As I'd, I'd like to hear from Mr. Okros if I could. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll make two uh, shorter comments. Uh, first one is we tend to talk about CAF culture, and I think it's important to recognize there's multiple facets of culture internally within the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, so it's a complex issue, and that's one of the challenges is understanding what culture looks like and how it's lived um, down at unit levels, at small team levels, um, because there's differences. Um, and so that's the first part that I would offer. The second comment to can to uh, concur with Dr. English's comment, um, there is a difference between understanding and implementing culture change versus investigations of wrongdoing. Um, they require different mechanisms, they require different frameworks, um, and they lead to different outcomes and initiatives. So I think we I would agree with we need to keep these two things separate. Um, Outside of the Canadian forces, or do you believe they can do it from within? Um, I do not have the expertise to talk on detail, but I would point out that there is a lengthy history of research and review of military discipline and justice systems, um, including by previous committees. Uh, and I think care needs to be taken uh, when there's efforts made to make changes to those. 